Good evening, everyone. It's great to have you here. My name is Brian Bennett, and I am the Alumni Relations Officer here at Trinity Development and Alumni. Many thanks for joining us for this latest episode in our Inspiring Ideas at Trinity series. In this evening's webinar, our MC Ruth Smith meets the world-renowned composers and Trinity graduates Emer Noon and Peter Whelan to discuss their impressive careers, musical influences, and inspirations. We will touch on a wide range of topics, including accessibility in the arts and breaking musical boundaries, as well as sharing some great stories about their experiences as conductors and composers. A few things to note before I introduce you to our speakers. This webinar will last just under an hour. The talk itself will last around 30 minutes, after which we'll open the floor to audience questions at the end of the discussion. Please do use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. We encourage as much audience interaction as possible. You're welcome to pop them up as they, you think of them throughout the webinar. I'd like to note that we are using Zoom generated automatic subtitles for this webinar. If you'd like to turn these subtitles on or off, click the CC closed captions button at the bottom of your screen, then click show or hide subtitles. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for later viewing on our Trinity Alumni YouTube channel. I'd like to introduce you now to our speakers. Emer Noon is an LA Dublin based conductor and award winning Irish composer, composing extensively for film and video games, and an advocate for creative women in technology and music. As one of the world's premier composers of video game scores, Emer is responsible for some of the most enduring soundscapes on World of Warcraft and other best selling titles which has earned her industry accolades, including the Hollywood Music and Media Award for Best Video Game Score. Alongside composing, Emer conducts orchestras worldwide. Notably in 2020, Emer made history by becoming the first female conductor to perform at the 92nd Academy Awards ceremony. Olivier Award-winning Peter Whelan is among the most dynamic and versatile exponents of historical performance of his generation with a remarkable career as a conductor and director. He is artistic director of the Irish Baroque Orchestra and an acclaimed solo artist with an extensive and award-winning discography as a solo bassoonist. As conductor, Peter has a particular passion for exploring and championing neglected music from the Baroque and classical eras. At the beginning of 2022, Peter conducted Bajazet, a co-production by the Royal Opera House and the Irish National Opera, which was met with outstanding reviews and for which he won an Olivier Award for Outstanding Achievement in Opera. And finally, our MC for this evening, Ruth Smith. Ruth is a multidisciplinary performer, broadcaster and musician. An IMRO Gold winner of Specialist Music Broadcaster in 2021, Ruth shared her knowledge and passion for folk music on her show Simply Folk on RTE Radio 1 from 2017 to 2022. An experienced MC and events producer, Roots worked with the Volvo Ocean Race, the London Olympics, and with the GAA, MCing the All Ireland Hurling and Football Finals at Crow Park. Ruth is a founding member of the folk trio The Evertides and recently has been training with the intention of weaving together her arts practice and therapeutic work. Ruth, over to you. Thank you very much, Brian, and welcome to everybody who's joined us tonight for Inspiring Ideas at Trinity. Behind the music, conductor stories with our two wonderful panelists. We have Emer Noon and Peter Whelan, and it's a real honor to be here to chair this chat between the two of you. I think we were, we were all floating around House 5, the music department in Trinity, around the same time. Um, but before we jump into the nuts and bolts of the Q&A, I'd love for everyone who's joined us here this evening to get a sense of where you're calling in from. Um, I know we've got a couple of different locations. Uh, so Peter, can you give us a sense of where you are, where you are in your day, what you've just come from, what you might be going to after this, the weather, the time of day, go on, make us jealous. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm in um, um, downtown San Francisco at the moment. So it's like 11 a.m. for me. Um, I'm just in the middle of um, a production of, of, of Gluck's Orfeo that I'm conducting with the San Francisco um, Opera. So uh, the day's been slow enough so far. I've managed to squeeze in a, a, a quick board meeting just before I, I, I arrived here. So all of the, this is the business end of the day. And uh, we have um, two more shows. So I've got a few more days between them. The, the singer's voices are going to rest for a few days. So I'm 
uh, finally enjoying being a bit of a, a, a tourist in San Francisco. So I'm looking forward to having more of a of, of a nosy around. Gorgeous. Well, thank you for joining us. And Emer, let us know where you're calling in from. So I'm actually home in East Galway. Uh, we divide our year between uh, Malibu, California and uh, East Galway. And we've just finished um, building a studio here. So I'm, I'm calling you from my uh, sort of composer's workstation. And um, yeah, um, happy to be here. And uh, uh, Peter, uh, say hello to some of the orchestra members uh, there would have uh, uh, recorded a lot at, at Skywalker Ranch, where strangely enough, a lot of the video game scores <laughs> recorded. So they're the say hello to, to the uh, the opera orchestra members for me over there. They're very special. Lovely. And so what this is behind the music uh, and that's what I'd love to do. I'd love to bring you all the way back. If, if you don't mind bringing us back to that burgeoning uh, curiosity that made you go towards music. Maybe it was someone in your home that was encouraging of your talent. Um, but those kind of, I mean, I mean, give us an overview of what it was like for you finding your way towards that first week, you know, in Trinity or the decision to make music something that you were going to study and then go on and excel in a career. Um, so, Emer, I'm going to start with you. Bring us to East Galway, little Emer, and, you know, those kind of uh, seminal moments or that kind of spark of passion. Uh, for music and and give us a kind of a whistle stop tour to that uh, fresh <laughs> freshers week. I remember I remember my my mother once saying, "We thought you'd arrived from outer space." You know that there was this crazy small kid who was just mad about the orchestra, and I'd never seen or heard one, only on TV, because uh, we have I'm from a village of under five hundred people, and uh, I often say that there just weren't enough people in my local village to tell me that what I wanted to do was, was absolutely nuts. Um, but across the road from our national school was the home of Paddy Fahey, who Ruth, you probably know really well, um, one of the best known composers of traditional Irish music in his lifetime. We lost him um, just a few years ago at 102. But the fact that, you know, you <laughs> For me, it was, you'd be a farmer, you'd be a teacher, a doctor, a nurse, a composer. You know, there was, there was like five or six careers. Um, but I didn't come from a professional musician family. Um, my father had great respect for musicians, but I come from an area rich in traditional Irish music. Um, and it wasn't really considered something you'd seriously do as a career, uh, especially when like most, I suppose most of us um, uh, classical musicians had other options academically, you know. Um, so it was, it was considered to be a bit mad. And um, I was lucky because there was another mad composer in my village. Um, Paddy and I used to go out and stand under trees and shout to hear the the, the length of delay coming from the, from the other side of the field. I mean, that's how <laughs> that's so eccentric I'm talking about. Um, but I have a visceral memory of my father calling me down to see something on, on the telly. And it was a guy with big curly white hair, tails, and the orchestra just going gangbusters. And I was so, I just fell in love instantaneously, so much so that I remember that moment. You know, I remember it very clearly. Um, and I always knew that that's what I wanted to do. For me, um, I have some physical restrictions and performance. I have um, a hypermobility issue where um, my hands sort of collapse. So being a, a concert pianist or a, even a decent pianist was never on the cards. So um, I always wanted to be as inside the music as possible, figuring out how does it work? This is magic. Why do I feel this? Why do I have goosebumps? What's happening? How does this work? And everything for me has been driven by curiosity. I'm, I'm sure Peter and Ruth, um, you'll say the same things, which is never once did I ask the question, well, what does a musician get paid? You know, never once did I wonder about uh, the the external things. It was always internal. How does this work? Why is it making me feel this way? 
Um, why, when I perform, is it making others feel a certain way? What's happening here? And delving into that truth as much as possible. And also the fact that it's a lifelong pursuit is very attractive to me. Um, finding out everything about music is impossible. And I, I like it that way, frankly. <laughs> So that's that's sort of I mean, I came up, I came to Trinity in a very roundabout way. I mean, my story is having no contacts, having, you know, from a very, very small place and eventually getting a scholarship to the College of Music for performance um, when I was in, uh, I think it was fourth year in art school. We're in Ballinasloe and getting on the train 6 a.m. every Saturday. There were um, there were four of us from Galway, two to the academy, two to the College of Music every single Saturday. And I have to say, I loved every single second of it. I couldn't get enough of it because I didn't really have that. I mean, the one good thing about growing up in a small area is I participated in everything musically. And I think that's part of my personality, but it's informed my career, which is I, I got some musical theater. My first job was playing flute and piccolo and pit orchestras when I was 14. Um, and doing, doing musical theater, being involved in traditional music, in folk music, in, in church music, in everything that I could be, I could participate in. You're nodding because I know you're you <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it was a, it was actually an amazing amount of experience. Uh, and an amazing, uh, broad, amazingly broad experience. Um, but um, by the time I got to Trinity, I mean, I was already obsessed with um, Nadia Boulanger. I was already obsessed. I, oh, I got, I was um, one of the, a couple of the, the, the things that happened accidentally. It seems everything to me has happened accidentally. There was no direction ever to a career or to even an education in music, it all happened by accident because some angel would jump into my path and, and pull me over, you know, to where I should be going. Um, one was Colin Mobby. I'm, Peter, I'm sure you know that name. Um, I was, uh, I, I wrote a piece for the Irish Chamber Choir and this is typical of my story, moonlighting as a student from another school. You know, and the, the teacher in the other school was the music director doing, what were we doing? Um, chorus line. And I was his assistant and I was about 15. And he said, why didn't you join us? We're doing this thing with the chamber choir. And I couldn't believe it. It was like all my Sundays had come at once, all my Christmases. It was just to me, it was better than anything. And I remember staying up all night you know, not getting my 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 uh, my SATB homework in on time because I was writing a piece for the chamber choir at night. But I had no guidance. I had no uh, my handwriting was terrible. We had no music notation software. I had nobody guiding me to say, no, no, no. For the tenors, you need a a, a, a tenor clef with a little eight on the bottom, and you know, and nothing like that. So I was handing in this stuff to Colin Mobby, who yelled at me for my terrible handwriting and then said, if you clean up your handwriting, we'll broadcast your piece on RTE. <laughs> and for me, coming from this tiny village, that was just unbelievable. Then I, a few months later, I got a, a, a message in the post saying, you've been accepted to the ASC, or ASCAP. Whoops, that's a slip. That's the American version. The IMRO... Um, Composition Summer School, NS Emerald Composition Summer School. I had never applied. It was Colin. Colin applied for me. And this is typical for me. Um, so I was the youngest student there for two years. And I got to study composition with people like Carlyle Rasmussen, Danish composer, Kalevi Aho is one of my fav favorite Finnish composers, well, one of my favorite composers um, writing contemporary art music. Um, I got, we, there was only about 10 of us and we got these amazing um, composers teaching us from all over the world. And I'm very grateful to people like Colin and people like that who, you know, fell in, you know, I fell into their path and they sort of pulled me over to the right direction because, and, yeah. And that's what I'm hearing as you speak, you know, this, this great apprenticeship that you had uh, without realizing where that would lead to and all the series of amazing opportunities as you said angels that would just grab you and pull you into another lane and give you more experience which is amazing thank right. you Emer. that's that's wonderful and peter for you if you can bring us back to to those burgeoning um 
curiosities to music and and where the inspiration came from were you from a musical family musical background no uh, musical background um, um uh my father was a mathematician and I, I didn't get on well with maths at all. I know this is because it's often say that there's a connection between the two, but he wasn't a musician. I wasn't a mathematician. But um, yeah, I, I just loved singing, being involved with music. I had a neighbor two doors down who who, who taught piano. Um, I really wanted to play the violin for a long time. Couldn't find a teacher uh, for that. So piano is how it started out. I uh, loved singing in school. We used to sing in the, in the National Children's Choir. Uh, which just opened my eyes. I couldn't wait to do the concerts, go back into rehearsals. It was just everything for me. I remember the the teachers at my primary school as well. There were three of the uh, female teachers used to sing with guitar, just like it's really close, uh, uh, three-part harmony folk music. And I just, uh, I, I remember that, just hearing that as, as, as a child and just being like up against the, the, the door trying to hear more of what they were doing. It was just like, it's like a, another world, just, you know, like tight-knit harmony. I remember just like, this is everything i need to be part of this and then i guess yeah the until now i'm, I'm 44 i was just like pursuing that uh, chasing it it could never have been um anything else so uh it's just uh, always been the path for me yeah uh you like that's my sweet spot as well three-part female harmony is where it's at <laughs> <laughs> definitely um bring me to your trinity days then peter and you know obviously you studied in house five but Outside of that, what involvement did you have in different societies? You know, what broadened your landscape and your perspective on music while you were in Trinity? Yeah, I, I wanted to be a part of as, as much as I could. So I was, uh, I had kind of started playing bassoon a bit later uh, compared to, to many. So maybe 15, 16, I'd started that. So I was kind of gigging, doing some freelance stuff on the, on the side when I was in Trinity, trying to get the performance side up. All is totally fascinated with the um, historical side of, of Dublin. I remember also going back to primary school. I remember we had these little uh, two-sided books about little, little historical things. And one was about how Handel had come and performed a science in 1742 for the first time. Picture of him in his wig, um, Fish Amble Street. It's like, oh my God, that's where, you know, it's close to where I'm from. So absolutely obsessed with that. So um, actually part of being in Trinity was, was the feeling that this is another old world kind of place um, from about the same time, you know, uh, and I, 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 there was, there's an aesthetic appeal about, you know, that 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 part of history, the, the, the school itself, the library, the beautiful surroundings, uh, and and actually there's a, a, Trinity houses a, a lot of um, um, 18th century manuscripts from the time of, 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 of Handel. But all of that, we're trying to expand on, on why Handel came to Dublin, what the music scene was like then, what was it like before, has uh, kind of pr pr propelled me on this amazing uh, a journey just to discover how much heritage we have as Irish people in, in, in classical music, uh, um, stretching back to, you know, whenever. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, it, I think that's basically what, you know, what drew me into, into Dublin life, wanting to study in an, in an old, beautiful place. And yeah, uh, and when I was there, of course, the, the, you know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, itches to be scratched academically but also performance side of things but the yeah uh, at that age you're just you're just soaking up everything i love how you mentioned um handel's messiah in 1742 because as i was preparing to chat to you i was kind of thinking of you know that interest that drew you into that antiquity which you mentioned um and and looking for the to unearth these these gems from the baroque era and it's interesting that thread, like you look at O'Carroll and the Belfast Harp Festival in 1792, um, that Italian Baroque thread that's that's in Irish music from from that era. And then you go through to Ocar or, um, Oriada and, you know, the harpsichord and the harp and that flavour being part of the folk music as much as, you know, how, how the two, the, the confluence of the two, I suppose that's with me with my folk hat on. But um, it's lovely to hear you, um, that that's the seed of where your interest in the, the Baroque music came from. Absolutely. And, you know, there's, I think looking back, say, to 18th century, which I do a lot of my work, there's a much more of a connection between, between you know, folk music and what we'd say classical music nowadays. There weren't such a, a big divides. And one of the more interesting um, features of them is the composers we've been discovering um, or, or, or looking into, like a guy called Matthew Duborg, who's a massive show-off violinist who led for, for, for um, Handel in Dublin. He used to disguise himself as a, as a fiddler and he'd go out to Dunboyne and they, 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 the crowd would spot him with his Stradivarius and they'd all kind of mob him. 
but uh, of course he's having to write stuff for for Dublin Castle for the for the institute for the you know the the institution that's in charge but um you know looking through his music we found um uh, amazing little Irish tunes written down phonetically from English into Irish and some of the you know the first uh, time that's been been found and it's 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 been really fascinating working with the you know um, people like Siobhan Armstrong, people from the, you know, the, the traditional tradition, because there hasn't been as much work done into that either. So that the two cross over in, in the most unexpected ways. Another guy is a Kusser, a Hungarian who came over. He also wrote down a Shin Shias Suis Lum in his little handbook, uh, which is just uh, fascinating. So there's, there's a huge confluence of all the different worlds, maybe even more back then that, that, than we have now. So it's a fascinating journey. Yeah. And, and I, I'm so much, I'm so interested in us looking at that kind of democratization and, you know, breaking down the, 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 the lines or the exclusivity within classical music as a, as an umbrella term, um, which you were both doing like, and I love, I said this when we chatted a little bit earlier, you know, that we've got this incredible scope of, you know, antiquity to futuristic sounds, you know, with your video game technology, uh, I've seen you wear the interactive, uh, is it AI? No, what's the oh sensors yeah <laughs> sensors to conduct with and everything you know so it's, it's it's amazing to see i suppose speaking personally and we're all around the same age you know studying music in the royal irish academy or the college of music and in trinity in the 90s it's a very different world now Emer, isn't it like people yeah. who go into classical music yeah i'll ask you the question do you think the accessibility is there more so than it was in our time well uh i will say this we we're recording hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of of music for media every year and it's like any genre of music you know be it people are starting to separate film music from game music i'm not entirely convinced by that but um in any genre of music throughout music history uh, certain things have lasted the test of time and certain things fall by the wayside. And that's absolutely what's going to happen with the music that's been made today, just like it's always happened. I mean, I'm always asked, well, is this worthy of the orchestra? Is this, you know, the next big thing? Is it not? Is it rubbish? Is it great? Is it, what is it, you know? And I'm just saying composers are doing what composers have always done, you know? And what's always happened is still going to happen, which is, some of it's going to be great, a lot of it's going to be good, and some of it's going to be rubbish. You know, that's, well, by by whose standards? But um, today, uh, more orchestral music is listened to through video game consoles alone than music in general throughout music history. And that sounds mad, mm. but I'm talking about the sonority of the orchestra and the psychology of that sound, that feeling being not your grandparents' music or something that's elitist or something that's, because we know that music is not elitist. Music is music, you know? It doesn't choose to be one way or the other. We surround it with baggage or whatever. That's what I truly believe. But I mean, to me, musical treasures are to be shared. My favorite music from whatever year, period, whatever era. I mean, for me, I believe in the artist rather than the genre. Um, and uh, there's so many treasures to share. And I don't, you know, breaking down these elitist sort of this baggage, really, it's got nothing to do with the music itself is important to me. Um, but the first step in that is making the sonority of the orchestra alone belong to your average person. I don't, you know, what's an average person? Um, but for, for, for anybody, for the yeah. general populace, that the orchestra is now a thing that belongs to everybody. Um, I've had so many, I've, I've shaken hands with literally tens of thousands of video game music fans around the world, and they expect to meet you after the concert. That's part of that culture. And I've said, you know, what's your favorite? What's your favorite piece? And they say, my favorite song is, because everything's a song, <laughs> um, is the theme from The Legend of Zelda, Twilight Princess, or something like this. And I say to them, well, if that's your favorite piece, does that mean that your favorite band is the orchestra? And they look at me and go, yeah, 
I, I guess you're right. I guess you're right. This is the music I listen to while I'm working or while I'm in the car, or while I'm this, that or the other. It brings back memories of this, this and this and this. You know, when I was in college, I listened to uh, Jeff Buckley, Grace ad nauseum for the whole year. So every time I hear that, I'm back in first year in college, you know, these kinds of memories like olfactory senses that bring you back to the moment. But it's important that just the feeling and the sound of the orchestra is current and it belongs to everybody. And I feel like right now in my career, uh, a huge part of my job is just inviting the public in to experience that sonority live mm -hmm. or to experience it through their game consoles or their, their movies or whatever, so that they can discover all of the richness behind because most of us that write music for film and video games are, are classically trained musicians. Yeah. So. And I love I love that you said as well, Emer, you know, composers have, will always do what they've always done, which is or respond to the demand of societal needs and, and um, trends. And on that note, I'm going to cue at the video of you in action and we'll see Peter in a little bit as well. So if that is ready to go, thank you. Brilliant. A, a taste of the two of you in action. Peter, you have recently won an Olivier Award for your um, your role in conducting Vivaldi's Bajazet uh, with <laughs> uh, the Irish Baroque Opera and the Royal Opera House in London. Congratulations. Um, I saw a video and it was one of the questions I'd written down as well, the kind of the constraints because conducting is such a, it's such a co-creative space and it's usually with huge numbers and I know it can be in smaller kind of groups and ensembles as well but I saw a video of you in rehearsal for Bajazette and it was amazing to see opera singers with masks on rehearsing and I was just like oh my god that was only a couple of years ago you know uh, talk to me about the process of preparing that show and and what it felt like to to be recognized with that honor well, the uh, awards are, are what they are. They can be very um, uh, arbitrary, uh, you know, like you just happened to, to land on. Well, we, we were in the right place at the right time. What was really proud about that show was just that we, we, we survived uh, COVID. And actually here, uh, in the, which is, uh, you know, uh, that was a very small show that we, we we could keep very very light and, and moving. But of course, it was rehearsed during the pandemic. But even here in San Francisco, at the moment, the musicians rehearse and perform with with masks on and in the in the in the rehearsal room there's a very strict um regimen of testing all the time but the singers here have these amazingly huge masks and, and only the and the conscious they come off so they're amazingly brave and resourceful um when it when it comes to you know people really want the music to happen yeah. um so it, it, it's super challenging working with opera is 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 a kind of a chaotic profession i, I never remember signing up for it. Um, uh, I think if you said, I want to do that, I want to become an opera conductor, it's, it like, would never never happen. But you just have to keep a number of plates spinning at any, any number. You have these amazing musicians all in the darkness of the pit, uh, quite relaxed. You have the, the bright lights of the stage, people with adrenaline running every direction. So what 
gesture what thing could you possibly say with with your hands to one set of people that would mean something for for, for the other group but it's it's wonderful it's well like it's of course the like highest art form everything coming together especially the the word thing I'm working at Bajazet too but just a you know a blend between uh, dance movement text um poetry uh, music you name it and I think that that's you know the, the, like it's a high point of, of western culture so we have all of those things coming together they shouldn't make any sense but um it's still there and we're still telling the same stories as we did thousands of years ago and they they resonate now I think that's yeah. what it's all about just making making the you know music from the past speak to us nowadays there's, there's so much we can learn there's so much we can take from that the little video you saw there for instance is a, is a piece I discovered by a Belgian composer who came to Dublin uh, it's one of the very first examples of a crescendo ever it starts uh, uh very loud gets soft and then it comes back up again so that's like the iPhone 14 is the latest <laughs> technology in music. But that happened in Dublin. You know, like people know about it. Like we were super advanced for the time. And I, I just love being able to tell stories, um, getting people interested in music that happened in Ireland. Um, I think sometimes we're we're shy of, of classical music, but it's a heritage we, we we could definitely own. And there's so much to e e explore and tell. And, and just these pieces hidden in, in plain, plain view, you know. Um, so it's just uh, I think for, for me, it's always about the the storytelling involving the audiences and no, no matter what I'm doing if, I, if I'm playing bassoon if I'm if I'm, if I'm conducting um, if I'm if I'm making CDs or doing research it's always needs to be uh, um, um, communicating something or telling telling a story mm. and like you said those timeless themes that like when you spoke about the 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 singers having these bigger masks I think of you know you think of ancient Rome and how they had masks in in these big spaces um to tell stories and tell us a little bit about the themes within Bajazet, because I know they were quite prevalent um, or pertinent to what we're going through. Yeah, and actually the same with the, the Orfeo that we're doing at the moment is, is a kind of a journey from, from grief and darkness into, into, into um, you know, light and, and redemption. Like so often, nearly every opera story is about that or about love and death. And definitely the, the Bajazet was very visceral, very violent, um, uh, claustrophobic. Um, one of the main characters, uh, well, Bajazet, was, was tied on stage, was tethered the whole way through, was taunted. Um, very powerful women in the story. We often forget that, but they, they're the ones who who who, who uh, have the sway, who can control the outcome of the, of the opera. And of course, uh, I think we were the first people to perform Vivaldi in the, in the Royal Opera House. I'm crazily passionate about about his kind of music. It's nice to have you know this composer from Catholic background. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of Handel and Bach too. But but Vivaldi, he wears his emotions on his sleeve. Uh, it really only comes to life when you have a, an audience. Um, it, it, he's like a, he's a show off. He's 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 appealing directly to the audience, and I, I just just love that about his music. And of course, that's the other thing about the pandemic is we you know, well at least I have always I've been inclined to take the the audience for 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 granted, but we really miss them. And having that triangle of communication with the with the audience, having them back again. Has just made all of the difference and I'm, I'm never going to look back or, or under and underestimate that relationship again i think brilliant oh that's great thank you peter you mentioned a couple of things there powerful women and firsts you said it was the first time vivaldi was performed in the royal opera house so that's gives me a perfect cue back to you emer uh powerful women and firsts you were the first woman to conduct at the oscars uh was that two years ago god it feels was like 2020 it was yes or... <laughs> and, and and I'm going to wind back a little bit more from that and then we can come back to the Oscars because it kind of I'm baffled that you were the first woman to conduct in the National Concert Hall as well and is that is that true? Um, I never said that actually <laughs> and I have told journalists so many times and I go please correct this because okay, okay. I doubt it highly doubt it um and uh, I have no idea <laughs> how that got out there. You can you can say things in interviews, and sometimes you quote it correctly, and other times. I but you were, you were one of the few women to conduct in the National Concert Hall well, back in the day. I'm probably one of the first professional orchestral conductors that, mm -hmm. of, of this particular particular gender mm -hmm. from Ireland. Um, but uh, one I'm discovering at the moment is. Uh, uh, I uh, is the first woman to ever conduct at the Royal Albert Hall, 
was Alicia Adelaide Needham from County Meath. And she was a composer and a suffragette, um, composer, conductor, and, and the same, she was, she was conducting her own music as well at the Royal Albert Hall amongst other composers. But um, she was a contemporary of Pankhurst and Dame Ethel Smythe and so on. But she I was lost missing from our history. And I had posted actually on Facebook, the power of, of social media, I was putting together a program of women composers that I admire and, and whose music I really appreciate. And I had a, a school teacher from Garbley College in Balanslow who taught my brothers actually say, don't forget Alicia Adelaide Needham. And much to my embarrassment and shock, I'd never heard of her. And I reached out to some other Irish women composers and asked them, do you, do you know about this? incredible legacy of this woman and they hadn't either so I found that quite upsetting and of course uh P Peter as you can imagine I'm addressing that at the moment in every way I can finagle it to celebrate her um because I had my own debut at the Albert Hall last June and I was so proud to not be the first Irish woman uh on that podium mm. conducting their own music and she had done it all already. And what would have been really important to me as a, as a kid, and in particular as a young student, would be that uh, my comeback when I was told what I wanted to do was impossible would be, well, Alicia did it in the 20s. I'm sure there's, something very, there's something very buoyant about that. And similar to what Peter was saying about, you know, back in the 1700s, you know, there, were, there weren't these lines. There, were, there wasn't this kind of boundary between folk music yes. and classical music right. we see it in our lifetime i suppose right um, so there's something very comforting about that that it has been done before it was kind of forgotten the revival work happens we remember these people we champion the people who did it before and you're kind of on the shoulders of all of that which is which is lovely right well i love actually in early music how uh they speak of fiddlers you know and it's it's not it's not this sort of separating the violinists from the fiddlers it's you're a fiddler and and that's that's authenticity, and I, I love that. Um, one of the things uh, for me, one of the reasons I moved to Los Angeles was I wanted to work and bring different genres of music and learn about different genres of music and bring them together with the orchestra, uh, be it R&B, rock music, pop, um, modern opera, <laughs> everything and anything to try and, you know, fulfill this or, or satiate this mad curiosity, um, which is ongoing. Um, and I hear that in you, Peter, as well, um, vibrantly so. Um, but being, being able to step outside of the box, not being hindered, not being limited by other people's uh, ideals and other people's ideas of, of what you should be or what you shouldn't be. Um, so, um, the Academy Awards, yeah, it was like I'm going, what? They had never done Vivaldi before at the Royal Opera <laughs> House. Um, yeah. yeah, some of these things are just odd, you know, and, and you're going, well, why? Um, a stick of rosewood is is not that heavy. Yeah. Um, but it, it's 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 been a it's been a journey. It's been a journey for me. I see things as being more open, thank God. For the ones coming behind me but we're still the 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 big pyramid we're still you know just below marinal sup and the the ceiling breakers there's there's a row of the rest of us and then there's a bigger row coming behind that and so on and so forth if i can bring you back to your practice and i and i don't just mean like your practice as in as a musician as a conductor how you approach the craft of your practice what is the thing that drives you both? This is a question for you both in your success. Like I, I keep hearing the word curiosity. Um, obviously that, that, that is a big drive and it's like to find out why, what, you know, you did this at the start team. Like, wh why am I reacting like this to this music? And Peter, you finding yourself in the center of Dublin city center, you know, realizing that Handel premiered Messiah just down the road from you. So curiosity is a big part, but if you can dig into it a little bit more in terms of your practice, your aesthetic, you know, the kind of cornerstone of what drives your success, what would that be? And I'm going to go to Peter. 
Uh, well, I, I, you know, I worked for many years, uh, 20 years in, 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 in orchestras, you know, chamber orchestras and symphony orchestras. So um, I, I've kind of, you know, um, got my chops that way of, of working in orchestra. I love making music um, and, and making sounds. And in that time, you know, I just get to, you get to see from the directorship at the front, from, from the leadership, what works and what doesn't and what, what what's frustrating. And, and so often the problem is that, you know, the people you see at the front um, don't have a, have, a, have a background in music, haven't spent a lot of time as a repetiteur, haven't been a, 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 a musician or a singer of some way, so that they, they maybe don't always haven't done enough work to to really engage with the musician. So I'm all about enabling musicians who are in front of me. And uh, sometimes I get it right, sometimes I don't. But my, but the plan is always to. There's so much uh, talent in in front of you most of the time. It's just to find a language to 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 speak to them. And and, and if I feel that I'm enabling them, of course, as a director, you have to get from A to B. But you can take many different routes to get there and and, and take many people's ideas on board. So you know that's that's where. Um, I'm at, and that's what that's my what I'm trying to do when I'm out in the world. And it's it, it it can work well if if musicians you know they they trust you if you find a good vocabulary for for talking to them. If that works and the musicians feel they're they're free and and speaking and communicating, then the audiences feel it as well. So um, if on a good day it means that you can really make the music vibrant and really make it it, it speak. So that's uh, yeah, that's kind of the, the where I'm where I'm at with my nice. my. Game plan. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, and Emer, for you. Um, God, I mean, I've had people say to me, "You must be so ambitious. You must be so driven," and this kind of thing. And 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 I, it made me think. And I think, you know, I'm really not at all ambitious. I I just want to know more about music. The the career stuff. Is stuff I have to do so that they let me do music. You know, that's the only reason I do it. I get a little message every every other day saying, Emer, you need to do some social media, <laughs> or you need, you need to do this, you need to do that, and it's it's all just so as I can so as I can do music. And for me, oh my God, I love orchestration and, and composition so much, and and getting to actually perform it uh, myself interacting with film directors, interacting with producers, people who create uh, uh, from other disciplines and coming together with them and creating something that's better than the sum of its parts that I wouldn't have created had I not, had I not been working on this, this film or this game with this amazing, uh, these amazing screenwriters and this amazing director with this incredible vision. Um, and and for me, uh, my process, I suppose, is a lot of it is sitting in a chair um, with a score or sitting in a chair at my, my computer um, and way before I get to the orchestra. And when I get to the orchestra, then my, my situation, if I'm in the studio recording a score, is to make everybody as comfortable as possible. I always let them know what the project is. You wouldn't believe the number of times musicians go into a session and they're not even told what they're working on. You know, um, I do things like talk back between the booth and the conductor. Everyone can hear it. It's like I want, unless I have some crazy absolute, you know, if there's some crazy situation happening back there, I need, I still need to protect everybody and, and, and allow them space to do what, what we need to do. I have to work with a lot of technology, which is another variable, a lot of synchronization technology to be able to be as musical as possible whilst dealing with that technology. Um, uh, synchronization, we have lots of different methods of doing it. Um, uh, we, we use, we call punches and streamers where I'm looking at a screen, trying to give us some space to be musical and yet hit edit points on the screen in front of us. Um, I could be using click tracks in my ear. I could have track in my ear. I could have electronic instruments going into my ears and I'm trying to match the orchestra with it. It's absolute, absolute craziness. It could be an, an opera where we've synchronized some elements on click track and others not, and we've singers. And as Peter was saying, and lights and screens and holograms and crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, 
it's a completely overstimulating. Yeah. Um, but um, sometimes I come come away from a rehearsal and I can stare at a wall for two hours <laughs> because the stimulation is just so so overwhelming. But um, I think I'm I'm just driven by uh, curiosity, by the love of doing it, the love of being with other musicians um, and creating and you know my position in the community is I create something to pull people out of their problems for a couple of hours yeah. to lift them up for a couple of hours and maybe if it goes really well it gives them something to to ruminate on later that brings some joy um I mean I'm watching Peter's performance and it just looks so joyful there's so much joy there and it's just contagious and by the way um I want to point out which for me is a total treat seeing another Trinity alumna house five alumna in the video Claire Duff playing violin so so brilliantly as she always has done um but I'm wittering now and going off topic but <laughs> I hope that's we, we've got we've got a rapid fire questions either. So I'm, <laughs> okay, I'm going to <laughs> just to say to everyone who's who's listening in, if you'd like to put a question in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, we'll be finishing up soon. So if there's anything that you want to ask Peter or Emer, please do put your question in there. Um, yeah, thank you both so much for that. And, and you did mention Emer about the joy, you know, in watching Peter in his zone, in his flow. And I could say that about the two of you. I, I think that's the, it's a kind of an inexplicable thing. You know, questions are redundant in a way when you're in that space and when it just all clicks and when the music and the people and the co-creation of space and uh, yeah, and you really do see it in your faces, which is the real, um, yeah, it's the real answer, isn't it? So quick fire questions. Are you ready? You can't really think too much about these now. So I'm going to start with Emer. So we'll, pop back and forth between Emer and Peter. So what musician is your number one hero? Oh, I that's really, really tough. Um, I did, as I said earlier, was and still am slightly obsessed with Nadia Boulanger, who um, uh, taught some of the great composers of the 20th century. And one of the reasons I sought out and was so excited that Gerhard Markson came to Dublin when he did, which was just as I was finishing Trinity, um, was he was Igor Markevich's protege and Markevich was one of her students, but she taught Leonard Bernstein. She even taught Quincy Jones for a while. Quincy, who I is a hero, you know, um, she taught uh, Aaron Copeland, Charles Ives. And then those composers had, you know, students like Steve Reich. It, it just continued and continued her influence throughout the 20th and the 21st century. And she always said her finest student was her sister, Lily. Um, and this was a woman who was not, you know, she didn't wax lyrical. She was very pragmatic. She was very practical. And I remember that led for, to um, me uh, going, going to Paris with my parents to find some Lily Boulanger scores, which I did in... <laughs> in the red light district in a group of, um, in the basement of Flute des Pins, the, one of the, the music chain, music uh, shop chains in, in France um, and, and obsessing over that for endlessly as well. So Brilliant. she's probably my, my big shero. Amazing, you've given us a great uh, family tree of, of all the influences she's had. Uh, Peter, you, who's your number one musical hero? At the moment, it's a guy called Corey Henry. I really enjoys a jazz, uh, American jazz pianist, organist. It's fabulous. Yeah. Great. And I'm going to start with you now, Peter, just to put you in the hot seat. What has been the best moment of your career so far? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> oh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm just going to say the, the, the latest thing. A couple of days ago, we did a live stream. It, it came together. We've been doing the show three times in a row, and it just gets better and better. So I'm going to buzz from that one. So just the, the last performance we had. Gorgeous. And you, Eber? So this one's a bit convoluted. Um, my best moment of my career is kind of tangential to my career, but it's my proudest moment um, in, in my career, sort of is um, winning a major lawsuit in the state of California that protects pregnant women of the stage. And going forward, any production that originates in the state of California protects pregnant performers and it carries my name. And I'm very, very proud of that. Amazing. Well done. Yeah, that's great. 
This one is really trivial. Coffee or tea, Emer? And if tea, is it Barry's or Lines? Okay, well, first of all, there's no touring without coffee. Forget it. There's just no... What's, what's your go-to coffee? What's your go-to coffee? The black one, that if I could have it intravenously when I'm on the road, that'd be great. Perfect. Uh, but tea is definitely Barry's. Okay. Yeah. And Peter? Well, coffee all the way. Right. Yeah. Oh, you can have some right now. <laughs> do, do you just go Americano or like what? Is it oh, a no, milky it's a, coffee? It's a, have a bit of um, uh, uh, milk in it. So yeah, a flat white. I, I mean, kind of um, coffee central right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm like. You're well yeah. caffeinated. <laughs> um, okay, Bach or Vivaldi, Peter. Oh, you can't. You can't do that. No, no, no I can. I can. You have to answer. <laughs> no, I think I'd have to take my own life first. Yeah, it's just defense of the day. <laughs> Okay, okay. I think if it's Bach and Vivaldi, we have to say Bach, but 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 poor old Vivaldi. Yeah, oh so. dear. Okay, and and Imer, I'm gonna move it a little bit for you. So Mozart or Bach? Oh, that's painful. That's painful. They're so different. I mean, they're just so different. I can't even. It's it's like Beatles or the Rolling Stones. I mean, what are you gonna say? You know, that's that's how I feel about it. Uh, I love Mozart's sense of humor. I, you know, so much of what he does makes me laugh. And I feel, I really feel his personality. I can hear it all these hundreds of years later. But Bach, I mean, my brain is just, go, is just having, a, having a party when I hear Bach. So I, I can't, they're so different. You're I, on the fence, yeah. you're on the fence. Yeah. Okay, so favorite place in Trinity, uh, on Trinity campus. Where's your favorite place, Emer? <laughs> my favorite place is the... Uh, the music society room, the one that looks out on Dane Street, because I had the keys for, to it for like two years. And uh, and I never brought anybody who was on tour playing a gig in Whelan's there ever after. It never. That never happened. Um, so that was my, that's my favorite place on campus in Trinity College. <laughs> and you, Peter? Um, there's a rare books is pretty cool. You have to go down like a whole lot of um, uh, a little kind of labyrinth of stairs. And it's like a really cool um, um, secret library. You might find Andrew Johnson on occasion. At least the last yeah. time I it. <laughs> it, it smells great. It looks great. It's super Harry Potter. Very good. Okay, we've got some questions here from the people who tuned in. This is from Anthony Hopper. Uh, Emer, what piece are you most proud of that you've composed? Um, I wrote a piece um, called Malach Angel Messenger for World of Warcraft, Warlords of Draenor. And it's actually pretty much a tone poem based on the story of Masada, um, the incredible history of Masada. And I've gotten to perform it um, all over the place. And one of the great things is they tell you in, in film and in and video games, you know, when you're writing the libretto or the lyrics for the choir, don't write something that influences the the audience. We want you know made up Latin words or kind of uh, stream of consciousness type stuff that isn't a real language. So, so I I have these like in, in interloper Irish words stuck in there phonetically all the time. You know, that's, pa that's Paddy Fahey's influence on you. Know? <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I remember being in China and hearing all these this Chinese choir singing you know, Egshua Legia in Irish, right? And I just, I was like, it was a really poignant moment, but I was, you know, I couldn't help laughing on the stage. Peter, we have a question from James Fleming. To what degree do you strive for historic accuracy when conducting Baroque music? Do you prefer to you do you prefer the use of Baroque instruments and adjust the orchestra's tuning to match historic records? Sure. I mean, you, 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 there's lots of ways to skin a cat. I mean, you can, and you can work with many different kinds of musicians. But the important thing is, you know, you need to just key into the to the language of of, of the like 18th century classical Baroque style. Um, so it's just like speaking Italian or French. You just need to know where the pushes are. Um, you know, sometimes the music looks very simple. In case in point is Vivaldi, you just get two very simple lines. But you just need a few keys to unlock where the you know the soul is, where the heart is in the in, in the music, and then you're away. Uh, using uh, um, uh, historically informed instruments can really help in a lot of respects because, um, you know, the shape of the bow, the way the instruments speak. Um, the, the, the big advantage to using the old instruments is you can play full. So you can push all, all your pressure on, on the violin. You can put all the air through the instrument and you still won't overwhelm the human voice. So it means you get a much more kind of gutsy, visceral effect. Sometimes when you're playing on modern instruments, especially 
like um can be done of course but like something like mozart it needs to be you need to feel that you're you're pairing it back especially if you're using say a steinway or something uh it, it doesn't always help Mo Mo mozart's language even beethoven like for instance uh if you're playing on a, on a forte piano, you need to feel your, the instrument's going to break. That's not going to happen when you're playing on a Steinway. So you can really you get the feeling that 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 you're, you're pushing the 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 capabilities of the instrument. So you learn a lot from the old instruments. But that's not to say you know you, it can't be done by by everybody. And 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 here in, in San Francisco's modern orchestra, they've really found the the style. We've done we've done some work on that. But um, yeah, there's, there's, there's room for everything and we can be inspired by the past. They say historically informed performance, sometimes call it hip, but maybe it's better like if it's historically inspired yeah. um, practice so that we can just take ideas from the past. Like um, these instruments are perfectly good for the composers that, that, that we're dealing with them. They might have liked the ones we have now too, but um, uh, yeah. And also pitch can sometimes help as well. If it's slightly lower, it can sound more mellow. Sometimes it makes more sense for the for the voice. Sometimes, we're, we're, you know, they're pushed very high nowadays and the, the feeling might be more uh, re relaxed in certain respects. So, um, yeah, they all they all have their place. Great. Uh, we have a couple more questions and then we will close up. Emer and Peter, this is to you both. Thank you for allowing us this small insight into your lives. It's from Niall Allen. Uh, what music are you listening to now when you want to relax away from the day job? Uh, that's always an interesting one, isn't it? Being an active listener. Uh, do you ever listen to music passively to relax, <laughs> Emer? I, I can't passively. I mean, I'm always actively listening. It's a problem. It's a real problem, especially when you work uh, with movie scores and things it's really hard to bloom and well watch a movie yeah. and relax and not think about it. and by the way peter <laughs> i need to have a sidebar with you about tuning at some point because it today our our issue is 440 versus 442 versus 443 to tune an a and one of my <laughs> pet <laughs> hates is when i can hear on a, a score that we have now we, we a lot of our scores are hybrid. So you're using synthetic instruments with live instruments to create a, a, a an even bigger palette. And um, I, I when I can hear that the samples are generally recorded at 440 hertz uh, and I can hear the orchestra playing along at 442, that that takes me out of the film. <laughs> I don't care what the actors are doing. I can't see anything after that. Um, yeah. So <laughs> um, I can't even remember what the question no, is. No, you're all right. We're, we're, we're <laughs> time for time now. So we're, we're to the buzzer. Um, Peter, tell us what music you're listening to if, if you have a chance to relax. I do I tend to, I mean, I've got lots of friends and colleagues who are always making wonderful recordings. So I'm, I'm listening to them all the time at the moment. There's a guy, Chris Bezadenhout, amazing forte pianist. I'm listening to a lot of his music. Kind of echoing what what, what Emer said that one problem I, I guess of the modern world is that you don't you get music everywhere all of the time so sometimes I, I would like appreciate that not to be there's kind of a bland kind of corporate music everywhere at a coffee shop every time you go out it means nothing and and it's there it's constantly there it's kind of like a a, a music and I find that's more disturbing than anything else like sometimes you just want absolute silence or engage with what you're doing yeah. I, I can't ever quite get my brain around why it needs to be everywhere all the time at this kind of soundtrack, but uh, it's something I miss, especially in, in coffee coffee shops. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think this might be our last question. Uh, it's from Kira Murphy. She is Trinity Singers conductor, and she said, "Thank you both for your insight and wisdom. Having got to where you are now, what advice would you give your twenty-two-year-old self?" A quick, a quick bit of advice before we wrap up, Peter. Um, I think you just have to, you know, trust yourself and, um, uh, you know, the things that you feel passionate about, follow them. If something doesn't feel right, just let it go. Uh, you know, at that age, you, you think that the, the world belongs to other people. There are no grown ups. You have to make <laughs> yourself. It feels like other people know what they're doing, but they don't. So you have to make your forge your own way and try to in, inspire people. Uh, but that's easiest to do if you feel it. If it's coming from you, it's something you really care about. So that, that, that's what I'd say. Brilliant. Eber? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. The, the one uh, quote, quote that I always think of that means a lot to me is Socrates said, know thyself and be aware that nobody else knows your capabilities, no matter what they do or what they say, know thyself. The other way of, of, of explaining that is listen to the still small voice, you know, and as, as Peter said, it's the, trust yourself. You know, trust yourself, follow the path. 
if you're ex- everyone I know that's great at what they do is extremely nerdy and extremely passionate about it and go there really really go there follow your curiosity brilliant oh my god I'm writing those three things down on post-its there are no grown-ups know thyself and listen to the still small voice thank you so much Emer Noon and Peter Whelan for this fascinating chat and um, yeah we'll speak soon Thank you, Ruth, for leading such a fascinating and educational discussion. And to Emer and Peter, and indeed Ruth, for being so generous with your time and expertise. You shared some very entertaining stories, I should say, and given us a lot to consider this evening. I'd also like to thank my colleagues in the alumni office, particularly Mark Deering, for making today's webinar happen. And thank you as well to everyone who joined us this evening and shared your questions. It's always fantastic to have such engagement and enthusiasm. This has been our final webinar for the 2022 series of Inspiring Ideas at Trinity, but I'm delighted to say that we'll be back in the new year with a whole new lineup of brilliant guest speakers and fascinating topics starting in January 2023. We'll be in touch in the new year with information about the next series and how to register for the first one. In the meantime, if you have any questions or comments regarding this webinar series or any other questions you'd like to ask us here in the alumni office, please email alumni at tcd.ie. I hope you've enjoyed this year's series and are looking forward to next year's. Thank you once again for joining us and until next time, take care.